praise the name of the living God. Hallelujah. Shall we just pray and begin? Father, we say we give you the praise and we give you the glory. And I pray that through the teaching of your word today, we shall be strengthened with might by your Holy Spirit in our inner personality, according to the riches of your glory, that Christ now dwells in our heart by faith. And because he's in our heart, we are rooted and grounded in love. And by this, we shall grow to, to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, what is the length, what is the depth, what is the height, and to know this love of Christ, which passes all understanding and knowledge. I take authority over every negative influence of Satan in our minds by way of dullness of perception, slowness to understand, bigotry, indifference, religious mindsets, traditional mindsets, personal private interpretations that do not conform to the finisher of Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for utterance this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you to be the first to log in standing. I bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you for coming on board and thank you for taking the time to come on board. I don't take that lightly. And this is me, your host, as usual, yours truly, Pastor Fred Abeka and Lady Patience Abeka and all the other faithful of Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, who would come and join on in later. Thank you. Well, this is the Christ Review Center. The song that is being played in the background, I do not have, or we do not have any copyright claims to it should it filter into the public domain it is just purely for the purpose of our meeting here so without much ado because of grounds that's to cover normally our friday should have been our question answer but it's interesting to notice that you know you guys are growing so well that you know no questions are coming it is a sign of it's a sign of spiritual growth and maturity you know the lesser the questions then it means that yes their understanding is becoming clearer and Clara, which is a very, very, very good sign to the glory of God, their Father. Hallelujah. All right. So without wasting much time, we'll just go straight into the teaching as others will come and join in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let me just do one. All right. So we are continuing on our journey. The true nature of God, the true nature of God seen in Christ, and look at where we are, lesson 72. <laughs> that is just absolutely fabulous. Uh, the study of the word of God is so lovely. It's so sweet, so comprehensive and expansive. Praise God. Welcome, 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 Sister Hetty and Rita. Bless you. Bless you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Bless you. I salute you as well. Thank you very much. All right. So we've got a lot to cover today, and let us continue on the true nature of God seen in Christ, or the true nature of God is seen only in Christ. Lesson 72. We are investigating into the assumption of God's nature. Has God got two natures, good and evil at the same time? We know that it's not accurate. Does God have anger <clears throat> or wrath? We know he doesn't. And once again, don't forget that, don't forget that, do not forget, do not forget. Welcome, 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 Mr. Sheila. Bless you, bless you for your faithfulness. Bless you. But don't forget that to understand this topic, that is why I've put it this way, the true nature of God is always seen in Christ. That is how this question is answered. Does God have anger? Look at Christ. Does God have wrath? Look at Christ. Does God have vengeance? Look at Christ. Does God kill people? Look at Christ. You have to look at it all in the light of Christ because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And a lot of people still struggle with that. A lot of people still struggle. They think that Jesus is another step down transformer of God. Jesus is God actually, who just became a man. He took flesh, he took body. Okay, so I don't want to go into that Christology now, try to, to cause it, but you have to settle that in your mind. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He proved it over and over throughout the entire epistles and throughout the gospels. Okay. So, which means that it's Jesus is God explaining God to man. Jesus is God correcting man's wrong notion about God under the Old Testament to men. Jesus 
is God declaring the exact nature and attitude of God to man. That means outside Jesus, outside Jesus, you can never know God. And there is nothing else about God that we are yet to see. Listen to the way I'm saying it. There is nothing more about God that we have not yet discovered that was not in Jesus. Because some believers still think that, oh yeah, you know, Jesus is God. But you see, we don't know, you know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. There's still the other side of God. No. Everything is Christ. John 1, 18. That is why I've termed it true nature of God seen in Christ. John chapter 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. He's talking about all the way until Jesus came in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the one, referring to Jesus, who is in the bosom or the in the bosom of the Father, he, 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 the one, who is the one, Christ, he's referring to Christ, for the subject of discussion for, was John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And if you drop down to the verse 12, 13, he said, and the word became flesh. Then the verse 18, before that, he said, there was a man sent from God. He was talking about John the Baptist. He was not the light. But the true light that lighted the whole world came into the world. In the verse 18, he said, no man. This is John's testimony. This is John's testimony. No man has seen God at any time. No man is no man. That means nobody from Genesis until Jesus was introduced to Israel when he came out of the river Jordan had ever seen how God looked like until Jesus showed up. He said, the one that is in the bosom of the father, he, Jesus, who is in the bosom, that bosom there confuses people because they are thinking that, you know, this is the father and Jesus is in the bosom of the father. So Jesus was, Jesus is junior God resting in the bosom of the father. The word bosom there is, is a very old English. It just, it just means that one of the same, the one of the same kind, one of the same nature, one of the same nature. The one, the same person, let me put it in today's context, the same person, the same person, but, 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 but he, need, he needed to be, have a body. He said, he has, lo, notice the language, John 1, 18, the one that is the same person, the one that is the same person, he has declared him. Please listen. He has declared, not going to declare. He has, that means in the earthly work of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John was a display, was a declaration, was an explanation, was a demonstration of exactly how God is, has always been, always behaves, will always be, and will never change. He said, he has declared. The word declared is the Greek word, exegomai. E-X-E-G-E-O-M-A-I. Exegomai. That means declared or showed, or manifested, or disclosed. Was by he, that is the same person who didn't have a body, who took a body, has taken a body to explain exactly, thereby, thereby canceling out all impressions that people had about God from Genesis to Malachi. That is one of the reasons he came to correct our thinking. So when you when you follow Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will always see him making statements like this. Either the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Essenes, E S S E N E S, these were all sects of the Jewish people, will come to him, or even, 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 even. Samaritans who were half Jew, half, you know, 
they will come to him and ask him some questions about God and ask him some questions about the law. And when he came to ask him some questions about the law, look at how Jesus answered. He either answered these two ways. Have you not read? That is one way you answer them. Then he will say, it is written, but I say. It is written, but I say. Have you not read? That means they were reading, but they were not reading well. One second, hold on. Hello, Mr. Ruth. Hello. Hello, Pastor. I've joined you. I've joined. Hello. Hello, Pastor. Yep. I, I thought you were yeah. calling me. Yes. Yeah, sorry, it was an error. Okay. I, thank you. I was trying thank to join in. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Bless thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank bye. you. All right, bless you. Right, so I said that Jesus always answered that way. Have you not read? I'm going somewhere with it. So please follow me very carefully. Leave religious mindsets and sentiments aside. He said, have you not read? That means, well, read means you are reading, but you are not reading correctly. You are reading, but you are reading out of context. You are reading, but you have missed the central theme. Then apart from that, he will say, it is written, but, but I say. So the, that statement, that statement of Jesus, but, I say the word but, B U T, always means cancel out what was said before and focus on what I am going to say. That's the meaning of the word English language, but. I remember, you know, when we were in school, when you say something then to your teachers or your seniors, and then you say but, they say, hey, don't say but, don't say but. You know, we didn't know the correct usage of the word but. The moment you use but, it means that you have canceled out. You have canceled out everything. So he said, it is written, but I see. So when Jesus said, but I see, means that what now I say is superior to what was written. So let me give you an example. They came to him and said, why did Moses issue a certificate of divorcement? Then he said, then he said to them, have you not read that from the beginning it was not so, but I say, see that? He said that so many times. So Jesus is God correcting men's wrong impression about the Father. So to always get an accurate understanding of God, look at Jesus. The Bible calls him in Colossians, he is the exact image, Colossians chapter 2, of the invisible God. He is the exact image. Jesus puts a face to the God that we cannot see. So when anybody in any shape, size, or form says that our forefathers knew God, it is the most erroneous statement that my ears can hear. Our forefathers knew God before the white man brought Christianity. That, that, that statement is so, is so erroneous, it requires for it to be greased with palm oil because God is Jesus. So if you say that our forefathers knew Jesus, then if they knew Jesus, why libation? Did Jesus pour libation? They say, oh, our forefathers knew God. They called him, they called him Yami, they called him death. If they knew Jesus, why human sacrifices? Why shrine? Why those festivals, all those demonic festivals? They did not know God, sorry. That is not God. That is demon worship. They thought it was God because there was no knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is Christ. So in dealing with this topic, you have to settle it in your mind that the Jesus is God. 
If you are still struggling with them, means that you have not settled in your mind that Jesus is God. That is why you are struggling. You think Jesus is different from God. See that? So Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 is, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Or another translation says, eternally changeless. So that statement in the Old Testament, where he said, where he said, I am, go and tell them that the I am that the I am. The Hebrew actually reads, I will be what I will be. And the, and the, and the, and the refiner Hebrew says, I will become a man. I will become a man. That, that statement, I am that the I am, means I will become a man. That has been the dream of God because of the plan of salvation. So I am bringing this in line because of what we are doing today. That above all the other explanations that we give, Jesus is the explanation of God through and through. You have to settle that. In your mind, in your heart, you'll be fine. Now that comes to the second question. And that's what we've been dealing with in 72 lessons. It means that those statements about, and God killed, and God got angry, and God got this, we have explained it all. That it has to do, first of all, that the people were spiritually dead. It has to do with language. It has to do with translation. And it has to do with what we call in, in linguistics, semantics and syntax. For example, I told you that in the Hebrew language, they did not have subject pronouns. Like I walk, you walk, he walks, she walks, they walk, we walk. They didn't have the I, you, they didn't have it. So translators inserted it to try and make sense of the whole thing. Besides, everybody was spiritually dead. So let us continue on this journey. That yesterday, one of the statements that causes confusion for a lot of people when it comes to the anger of God, the wrath of God, and all that is this preposition from we dealt with that yesterday. When they see the wrath of God, anger from God, vengeance of the Lord, the of, the from, there has been badly translated. I told you the translation is the problem. And what was the translation problem? The word that they translated from, of, is a Greek word, apo. And it is different from English language. So the translators use of, from, to mean proceeding from. And this is what causes problems for a lot of people. When they see the wrath of God, they are thinking that wrath or anger that is proceeding, coming from God. Whereas in the Hebrew, it is not wrath proceeding from God, but wrath away from God. Therefore, the wrath is not referring to God being angry. The wrath is referring to the consequences of the wrong choice of man in rejecting God. That is how it has always been used in the Hebrew. But once again, translators have a hard time settling that in their mind. Because not all translators are born again. So I want us to look at something today, and we continue with that. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians. First Corinthians. From here. Pay critical attention. Now, even before I go, I go there. I want to just do. It. I want to do a simple analogy before I go to the First Corinthians chapter fifteen about the anger of God, or so-called the anger of God. First of all, I showed you some weeks ago that anger is a work. flesh or the word flesh always wrath is a process vengeance is a process number two for somebody to be angry it means that events took them by surprise 
You and I, we don't know the next second. So things can cross in and upset us because we did not see it coming. According to James chapter 1 from verse 7, he said, let no man say that when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. For, temp for temptation does not proceed from God, nor does it tempt anyone with evil. But he said that one is tempted when he's drawn, process, drawn by his own lust. So to say that God has anger, it, you are implying that God has no control. You are implying that God has lust. You are implying that God does not know what is coming in the next second or minute. And God is not aware. So for you to say that already, you have discredited, you have discredited, you have discredited God completely. You have made God and brought God to the human level under the fall of Adam. Okay, so have that at the back of it. And let us look at something here. First Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 21. For since it was by, it was by death, it was by a man that death came. It was by who? It was by who? It was by who? It was by who? It was by man. That word man is generic. It means mankind. And of course, we know it is referring to Adam. When the word Adam is used, you have to determine whether it means Adam as an individual or Adam as a generic term meaning mankind. Because Adam is the first prototype of man and anything he did would affect the human race. For since it was by a man, not by God, that death came. That means death was not in God's creation. Death was never in God's creation. And it is also by man, a man, that the resurrection of the dead has come. So he's putting two together. Man, Adam, another man, the final or the last Adam, Christ. 22, for just as in Adam all die. Once again, I explained to you that that is not automatic. He's talking about the process of it spreading. So every person is potentially a sinner, potentially a sinner until the law. Because if you say that we are all sinners automatically, then it will mean that in the next sentence, then in Christ, all will be made alive automatically. But that is not accurate. Because they have to preach the gospel to you. So it's better to render it in Adam, all are sinners potentially. Because not everybody followed Adam's style. There were some people who enjoyed Limited righteousness, limited righteousness without the spirit of God living inside them. And I'll come to that. So follow me. But he's letting us know that Adam was the one that introduced the principle of rejecting God. And once you reject God, then the spiritual death comes in. So spiritual death is there potentially, but it is not activated until you come face to face with the message or the law. That is why children, children who die will go straight to heaven. Until the child reaches the age of what we call accountability. Accountability means no between good and evil, no the law, no all that, and us or come in contact with the preaching of the gospel. So let's go on. Watch carefully. I want you to give me your audience from here because. I'm going to go into something that's very, very, very critical. You need to understand. So, for just as in Adam all die, potentially, so also all will be made alive, potentially. That's the way it should have been rendered. It's not automatic. It took, it took time. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then those who are Christ own, will be resurrected with incorruptible, immortal bodies and is coming. After that comes the end, completion. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has made inoperative and abolished every ruler and every authority and power. Verse 25, watch it carefully. It's on your screen. Watch it carefully. For Christ 
must reign as king until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Watch, 26, the last enemy to be abolished and put to an end is death. Now you have to qualify what death he is talking about. Because if Christ has destroyed death, people are still dying. So I submit to you that in the Hebrew realm, it refers to three kinds of death. It refers to three kinds of death. Spirit will reject God. You are not, you are, you don't, you don't have a spirit in you, you are not united with him. Through that, then physical death or mortality will not enter your, your body, which is what Satan has. And then through that, if through your life, you never embrace the provision or the vaccine against spiritual death and physical death that Jesus did, then now you go and spend a third kind of death called eternal death with Satan and his demons in the lake of fire. And I'm not talking about Lake Busum Tree or Lake Taba, the lake, the lake of <laughs> the lake of fire. The lake. <laughs> He said, the last enemy to be, out, to be put an end is that spiritual death. Spiritual death and physical death and eternal death. The three abolished. That means spiritual death being separated from God first on planet Earth. And then if you don't believe in him, when you die, you are separated from him in, in Hades, the region of outer darkness and waiting that when thou when now, when now the final time of judgment, whereby you are judged by rejecting it, you are put in eternal damnation because of your choice. He didn't put you there, you chose it. He calls death an enemy. That's where I wanted to see. So if death is an enemy, how can God be using an enemy? Something that he didn't want to, to kill people whom he says he loves. And all the three deaths came about by Adam's disobedience and brought destruction and allowed Satan the control of men's hearts and the atmosphere, not the physical planet. I need to make also that place very clear. Let me make it clear. Satan does not control this planet. He controls the hearts of men who live on the planet and controls the atmosphere around the planet. How do I know that? The Bible says in the book of Psalms that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The word fullness means the inhabitants. So when we talk about world, there are two Greek words that are translated well. And the context will tell you. The first Greek word translated world is the word cosmos, C-O-S-M-O-S. Cosmos refers to the physical planet. And then there's another word, aion, A-I-O-N. It refers to the activities of men living on the cosmos. So when we say that Satan is the God of this world, he's not saying that Satan is the God of the cosmos, the physical planet. He's the God of the aion. That is the system run by men who don't believe in Christ. See that? So how can God, who finds death as an enemy, use death to destroy people's lives? Can you see that now? Now, I want to go somewhere with this, and let me jump to Hebrews 11, because I told you earlier that we said, just as in Adam, for since it was by a, man's, a man that death came, it is also by a man that resurrection. He said, 22, for just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. I want to prove to you that that statement is not accurate. He's not saying that it is automatic. He's saying that potentially. I'm going to show you men and women who, who enjoyed limited righteousness 
because they believed in the message. So salvation has always been there. Just that the difference for the people in the Old Testament was that it, they did not tell them direct in direct terms, believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. No, Jesus Christ was put, was shrouded in typologies, in types, was put, was put in analogies. Jesus Christ was, was put in types, in, in, in replicas. They didn't know that, but God was the one who knew that. So for him, so long as you obeyed whatever represented a type of Christ, he considered it faith and you were saved. The only difference is that you did not have the spirit of God living inside you eternally, like you and I have. That is something that he waited for the full proper price of spiritual death to be eradicated. So I need to show you that before I go on so you see that God cannot be the one who is the one that has the anger, the wrath, the killing. It cannot be him because God's consistent character has always been salvation to save. Watch carefully. Hebrews chapter 11. That is why that statement needs to be qualified when he said that and sin reigned from Adam to Moses. That means after Moses, he made provision for sin temporarily by the law of Moses and the rituals of Moses. And all those things in the temple were type of Christ, type of salvation. So it was in Ottoman, even though the DNA of the Adamic sin was in them potentially, but they were covered. They were covered on planet Earth, put limitedly until Christ came. That is why when they died, they were still sent to hell. Abraham, Isaac, but they went to another section of hell called paradise. At that time, paradise was still part of hell. And I'll show it to you very soon. So follow me. I want to show you something. God is not the one doing the killing. He's not the one being the angry one. No. So Hebrews 11. Now for your information, the argument of Hebrews 11 started in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 10. The latter part. Let me show you where the argument started. That is why you don't have to jump into the Bible verse and jump in conclusion. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Watch carefully the latter part of Hebrews chapter 10 where the argument, what was he talking about? So let's go up. Let's go up. So in Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 26, he was talking about that the people of the Old Testament had the message of Christ preached them in a style. And they had the same choice like as who they are preaching Christ to. Oh, so let me even go up. Let me start from the verse. So you, you will get it very clear. You will get it very clear. So pay, pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Hebrews chapter 10. Pay attention. So we are establishing again that God is not the destroyer. God is not the killer because the consistent plan of God has always been salvation from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through to Revelation. Salvation has been the same. And the way to come to salvation has been the same. Believe or not believe. Accept or reject. The same with Adam. Tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. The same. So salvation is not something new. The difference is that it was now Jesus came to establish that under the Old Testament, they didn't have the door. So I gave them a temporary measure. But now I am the door. All I wanted them to see was that it is me. In fact, if you study Hebrew, if you study the Jewish custom, where in terms of the temple worship, if you study it very carefully in the Old Testament, everything about the temple was talking about Christ, but they didn't know. The color of the gate, the red, the green, the yellow, were all talking about Christ. The, the, the fence of the of the of that of that of that tabernacle that Moses built was all about Christ because it was made it was made of linen and it was made of special wood. The linen was talking about the sinless nature of Christ. The rope that they used to tie the temple was made out of ram's hair dyed red, which was talking about the sacrifice of his humanity. The, the pegs that they hit in the soil to hold 
the tabernacle, was talking about that he would die and go into the earth. Then when you enter on the left, you will see the altar raised, which would be that Christ will be raised on the cross. Everything was Christ, but they could not see because of their state. So in Hebrews 10, when it says, for since the law has only a shadow, just a pale representation, the law, when it talks about the law, you must qualify it. It's not talking about, you know, the 630 laws. It's talking about a system. That means the 10 commandments, the 603 laws, the temple worship, all the incense, you know, the outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies, the Levitical priesthood, all the ceremonies of the living bread, the ceremony, you know, all of that of atonement, all that is called the law, the system has only a shadow. The word shadow means skia, S-K-I-A, skia, outline. It was an outline. It was an outline pointing to something, just a pale representation of the good things to come. The good things to come, the word things that is pragma, actions, 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 good actions not the very image of those things. So all that they did was just, that it was not the real deal. It can never, watch, it can never, by offering the same sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach it all altars. Verse two, for if it were, that means all those things that we were doing, if it could have saved lives, it could have dealt with the sin of Adam, why, did he, why didn't they stop? If Sodom and Gomorrah was able to destroy evil, why then didn't they stop there? After Noah's act, people kept on sinning. After Sodom and Gomorrah, sin was there. So the, that is not the target then. For if it were otherwise, would not these sacrifices have stopped being offered? For the worshippers, uh oh, did you see that word worshippers? But there was no music. Having once for all time been cleansed, would no longer have a consciousness of sin. So that is where the problem was. They were sacrificing to cover their sins, but there was a consciousness, a stigma, a sting of sin nature still speaking against them. Sinner, 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 sinner. That is why when you come into Romans chapter 8, this thing has been dealt with. He tells you that there is therefore now no condemnation or accusing voice. That's the meaning of that word. Katakrima. No accusing voice inside the man that is born again. But as it is, these continuous sacrifices bring a fresh reminder of the sins to be atoned for year after year. Verse four, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So that is the argument you're talking about all the time. You kept on going on, on, on. Then he comes to that prophecy. Verse 14, for by the one offering, talking about Christ, because under the Old Testament, that to be over and over and over again, he has perfected forever. Verse 14, verse 14, look on your screens. For by one offering, he's talking about Christ. He has perfected forever and completely cleansed. This is done once when you believe on Christ. Those who are being sanctified, bringing each believer to spiritual completion and maturity. Verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also has his testimony to us in confirmation of this. For after having said this, now he's quoting Old Testament. That means that this thing was planned already. This thing was planned already. Verse 16, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days. He spoke this. This uh, is taken from Deuteronomy. After those days. So those days are when? When Christ would have come. He said, this is the covenant I'll make with them after those days. Says the Lord, I will imprint my laws upon their heart. Figure of speech. You cannot physically write laws on people's hearts. It's English language. And the word heart there is not the heart that pumps blood. Bokum, bokum. Bokum, 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 bokum. Sometimes we read, we think that's what the word heart means spirit. He's talking about something. The word there's cardia. He said, I'll imprint my laws upon their hearts and on their mind, which is their mind. That is, so it's not talking about a nature. And I will inscribe them producing an inward change. Then verse, verse 70. Then he then says, and after those days, after when Christ has come and done the real deal, and their sins. That means not the temporal one, where they, where they have to bring animal sacrifice, and they do it then after you go. And even after they brought the animal sacrifice, there was no guarantee that they will not sin anymore. 
Even after the animal sacrifice, they were still sinning. So verse 17, and their sins, and their, now he's talking about when Christ come and do it, watch. And their sins and their lawless acts, I will remember no more. No longer holding their sins against them. Wait, does it mean that he has forgotten? God hasn't got amnesia. It's language. It's language. The word, the sentence, I will remember no more, means that I will never charge it to their account again. Why? Because it has been done. Under the Old Testament, it was always a constant reminder. That's why they have to do it every year. It means it was not removed. It was covered. But in Christ, there is no record. That means I have decided that Christ has settled it, and I will never bring it up again. Past, present, future. Child of God, since you got born again, God has not got any sins against you. Past, present, future. This is Bible, this is Bible revelation. This is true Bible teaching. Verse 18, we, we said, and their sins and their lawless acts, I will remember no more, which means no longer. He has decided, he has decided, he has decided no longer holding their sins against them. That is God's decision. You can jump up and down. You can cry. You can roll. You can do. That is God. You are not bigger than God. He has no problem with it. He has no problem. I said he has no problem. What's your problem? He has no problem. He has decided. 18. Now, where there is, look at, look at the language, where there is absolute forgiveness. Now, the word forgiveness there is a Greek word, aphesis. Which means, and it, 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 it even explains itself. Where the, look at the word, absolute. It doesn't leave anything to chance. Absolute forgiveness, which is complete cancellation of the penalty of these things. There is no longer any offering to be made to atone for sin. There is no longer. So that was the argument he was making. That under the Old Testament, if under the Old Testament, they believed in Christ in the type of you know, sacrifices, which was a type of salvation by faith in Christ, how much more? And he, to, to show that to us to you, some people believed and they were not destroyed. So from there, he goes on, 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 and on, 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 on. That's the argument he's making. He goes on again. He goes on again. He goes on again from here. Do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence, for it has a glorious and great reward, for you have need of patience and endurance, because there was persecution there. These guys were Jews in Hebrew, and they were wondering whether, uh, you said we must, we must believe on Jesus, but look at the persecution. So now he's bringing encouragement to these guys, for you have need of patience and endurance to bear up under difficult circumstances without compromising. Sounds like some believers today, that even though they are born again, and we said that we are blessed with us with your blessing, when small trouble comes, they begin to say that, ah, God, so you say you love me, why am I going through these problems? No, so that when you have carried out the will of God, you may receive and enjoy to what to the full what was promised. That means what was promised works, but be patient. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten. Verse seven: For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. He was talking about those guys that were under persecution. They were wondering things were going. They were killing Christians left, right, center. They were wondering, e, what is going to happen to us? Verse thirteen: But my but my righteous one, regardless of the situation, regardless of the persecution, regardless of the difficulties in life. He said that if you are born again, but my righteous one, the one just by faith, shall live by faith. That is how I've always operated. And if he draws back, the word draw back means to reject the gospel. My soul has no delight in him. But our way, you see, Paul, now the writer qualifies it. He said, but we who are born again, our way is not of those who shrink back to destruction. Did you see that? Shrink back means to reject the gospel. He said, we are not like them, of some of them who are in the Old Testament, who did not accept God's provision. He said, we are not of those. Our way, the born again way, is not about those who do what? Who shrink back to destruction. But we are of those who believe, relying on God through faith in Jesus, the Messiah, and by this confident faith. So he has qualified something. Under the Old Testament, it was temporal faith. In Christ, it is absolute confident faith. Based on that, now he jumps straight. Remember, there were no chapters and verses. There were no chapters and verses. So the argument is still continuing. 
Hebrews 11 and verse number one. Now, so what is now? The now can now can also mean therefore, therefore, therefore. What what I was talking about? I'm come to show you that that there were some people who enjoyed the protection of God because they believed. So he starts now. Faith. That word faith there is not faith as a as a way to try and get something from God. Remember, he was still talking about how the message in Christ was in types and shadows. It's what he refers to as faith. The message of Christ. Now, the message of Christ in types and shadows is the assurance or is the title deed. You see that it is like the receipt. They were enjoying the receipt. We have the real passport. See that all that was like a receipt under the Old Testament. Now, the, now faith of the Old Testament in the promised Jesus for them was what? Was a title deed. Confirmation of things hoped for, the things they were expecting for divinely guaranteed, and the evidence for them, they are not like you and I, who did not see or hear Jesus crucified. For them, it had to be a promise. That's why I said it is the only evidence they had of things not seen. They didn't see anything. They didn't see Christ like we have the historical account of Jesus. Like we have the historical account of his death, historical account of his burial, historical account of resurrection. They did not have any historical account, but they believed. He says that, verse 2, for by this kind of faith, the men of old, but he said the elders. So this kind of faith is about the elders, those of the Old Testament. We, our faith is not like them. Their own was promised faith. Our own is fulfilled absolute complete faith we don't need faith when you are born again you have all the faith you have romans 10 17 faith is by hearing and hearing by the word or the message of christ so if he goes on but let's i want you to see something so he goes now he starts to he starts to now number the people who believe in the message and even though spiritual death was potentially there, they did not come under it. So I can say, I can submit to you in a way that they enjoyed a bit of the born again life without them having the spirit of God inside them. So look at the names he's going to bring up about. So salvation has always been there. That's the point I'm trying to see. God has always been the saving business. Verse four, by faith, Abel, that faith there refers to the promise of Christ. By faith in the promise of Christ, they could not see Abel. So how did Abel know? Look at, look, he explains. Offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. That means the sacrifice was a type of Christ. And Cain did not believe that means Cain was told about this, but he rejected it and said, look, look, I can approach God anyhow. It does not matter. I can approach God. I don't need sacrifice. I'll bring, I'll bring orange. I will bring popo. I will bring a cocoa. See? But yes, it is still produce of the earth, but that is not what was accepted. Kabaya. Can you see that? So Abel enjoyed salvation limitedly. Even though they said that by one man, death or sin entered, but it was not automatic. Not everybody. Though it was in them potentially, but by them choosing to believe, they were exempt from the destruction that was in it. See that? Can, can you get that? Look at it. said by faith. Look at that. Look at, look at another man. Look at another man. Verse 5. So the by faith means by faith in a promised Messiah. By faith, Enoch was caught up and taken to heaven so that he will not have a glimpse of death. Be careful about that word heaven. It just means the realm of the immaterial, not heaven where God dwells. And uh, you see very soon. Wait, you relax. Relax, you see very soon. Look at that. Now, this statement, but without faith, it is impossible to work with God and please. That means that God's oppression always has been to either you respond to the message which is in Christ or not. 
It has been the same from Genesis till he returns. There's no different standards. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. By faith in the promised Christ, even though they didn't see him, but it was shrouded in the, in the instruction by faith with confidence in God, which is his word, Noah, what? Being warned by God about events not yet seen. See that? So God was rather warning him that some events are coming. He's not the one bringing the events. The disaster was coming. In reverence, that's the word reverence, in respect, in response, prepared an ark for the salvation of his family. Did no one know that it was about Christ? No. That is why it is called faith. That is why God said, wow, you have not even seen Jesus. You have not even seen his blood. He has not even, I've not even come. And I just told you that build an ark. Build an ark. And I knew what I had on my mind. And without questioning me, he said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Show me what to do. What, what should I do? Bring gopher wood. Bring tar. Bring this. Bring that. God said, wow. <laughs> wow. 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 He said, and by this act of obedience, he condemned the world. See, by his choice, he brought a separation to believe or not to believe. So it's not God who is bringing the, the, the destruction. Look at that. Next one, verse 8. All these guys enjoyed limited salvation. By faith, Abraham, by the promised belief in the Messiah yet to come. Abraham, when he was called by God, obeyed. Abraham was an idol worshiper. His father, Terah, they were moon worshippers. Was he perfect? No. But when God approached him, on God's mind, he had Jesus. And without having to explain all the details to Abraham, because we're all spiritually there, he said, hey, hey, listen, 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 listen. In you shall they see. Abraham said, yes, so. <laughs> God said, wow, wow. <laughs> Wow, 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 wow. That is why in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, the Bible said that Jesus in his own hometown, he marveled at their unbelief that ah, even in the time of these people, I have not come. I am here in living color. You can hold me. You can feel me. You can hear my voice. He said, he said, you're not believe. He said, you are a stiff naked generation. With all that, just like today, some believers, no matter the preaching, no matter that salvation is eternal, no matter that there's no anger in God, still, <clears throat> don't believe. They'll say, I want to see Jesus myself. G Jesus and his word are the same. Even if Jesus comes, have you forgotten Luke 16? Luke 16, what did the rich man tell Abraham? He said, go and tell my brothers. Let's send somebody to my brothers. Go and preach to them so that they don't come to this place of torment. You know what Abraham told me? Abraham said, they have the prophets. They have the prophets. If they can't believe the prophets, then even if I, Abraham, come out of, of paradise and go and talk to them, they will not believe. So believing or not believing is a figment of a person's mindset. He said, by faith, Abraham, look at that. Where he said that by faith he lived as a foreigner in the promised land, as in a strange land, living in tents as nomads, with Isaac and Jacob, who were fellow heirs. The word heirs is sunklericomos. Same, that means that we're destined of the same promise. Ah, there it is, of the same promise. I didn't even get there. Same promise. The same promise of salvation. Verse 10, for he was waiting expectantly and confidently looking forward to the city. The word city is a metaphor, which has foundations, an eternal heavenly city whose architect and builder is God. Oh, let's go on, let's go on. Look at the verse 13. Uh-huh. To answer Enoch's question, all these died. Who are the these? Abraham. Who again? Noah. Who again? Enoch. Who again? Abel. Huh? Huh? He said they died. They died. They died. So in the case of Enoch, what it just simply means that his body wasn't found. You have to understand those days, they didn't have forensics and all that. His body was not found. Simple. All these died in faith 
I'm not saying it, the word of God, guided and sustained by it without receiving the tangible fulfillment of God's promises. Hey, Makata Yabada. Salvation is not something that just came when Jesus came. Salvation has always been the plan of God, but it was put in typology. He said, all these people died in the faith of the promise, faith of the promised Messiah. Guided by it, sustained by it, without receiving the tangible fulfillment of God's promise. Only having seen and anticipated them and having welcomed them from a distance. And having acknowledged that, acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Can you see that? So that means that Abraham got to the city, Canaan. And he realized that, no, it's not Canaan. No, it's not Canaan. It's not Canaan. It's not Canaan. Canaan was just, was just a type of Christ. Look at it, verse 14. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. Of their own in what sense? Of their own they say that a place where, you know, it's all based on believing on God. 15. And if they had been thinking of that country from which they departed as their true home, they would have had a, a continuing opportunity to return. Verse 16. But the truth is that they were longing for a better country. That is a heavenly one. For that reason, God is not ashamed of, of them to be called their God. Even to be surnamed the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So the God of the Hashem, which means that that was the promise. Verse 17. Oh, my time is up. I have not even reached where I want to be. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, that's the same. Faith in the promise of God. So these guys were, were, were exempt from the destruction that was in the sin of Adam, even though potentially they had the Adamic sin nature. To prove to you that that is God's original plan. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, that word tested there is pistol. That word tested, not like, um, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you become. I don't know when. So I am testing. So you conclude and say that. Uh, but he said, the Bible says that, and God tested Abraham. The test there was not to test him in terms of morality or character. No. The test there just simply meant to see whether Abraham understood that what he was doing was a message that I want him to know. I want to know whether are we on the same page that Isaac is not what I am referring to, but it's Christ. That is why he wanted to know, watch, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, that is, as the testing of his faith was still in progress, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises of God was ready to sacrifice his only son of promise, 18, to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendants shall be called, 19, for he considered it reasonable to believe that God was able to raise Isaac even from among the dead. So he saw that Abraham has caught the message. We are on the same page. He knew that Abraham understood that I'm talking about resurrection of Christ. And indeed, in the sense that he was prepared to sacrifice Isaac in obedience to God, Abraham did receive him back from the dead, figuratively speaking. Figuratively speaking. So please, it is not a message about put your Isaac on the altar. It's not about money. It is not about money. It is not about money. It was a message of Christ. Watch. Then let's come to this one, which I'll deal with next week. By faith, Moses, after his birth, was hidden. He goes on and on and on. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of first daughter because he preferred. He goes on. He goes on about it. He considered. Look at verse 26. And I'll end with that. Moses considered the reproach of the Christ. Oh, oh. Christ. But Christ had not yet come. How did he know it was Christ? That's what I've been telling you. It was a typology. In the message, he considered the of he, the reproach of the Christ, that is the rebuke he will suffer for his faithful obedience to God, to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. For he looked ahead to the reward promised by God. But, so, because of that, verse twenty-seven, by faith he left Egypt, being unafraid of the wrath of the king. For he endured. He saw salvation. What? Ah, uh, salvation by faith in Christ. You know, by faith he kept the Passover. When he saw that, he was no more afraid. He was no more afraid. He was no more afraid. By faith, he kept the Passover. 29, let me end. By faith, the people of Israel crossed, crossed 
the Red Sea as though they were passing through the dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted it, they were drowned. So what is the message here? God didn't drown them. The message was the fact that if you believe in Jesus, you are out of Satan's control. If you don't believe in Jesus, you are under Satan's dominion. And all that Satan will do and has done and is involved in and his destruction will come upon you is the message. God didn't kill the Egyptians. Did you see there by faith? What is faith? Responding to the message of Christ in a figure. Israel, when he said, what do you have in your hand? The authority was a type of Christ. Moses represented the whole of Israel. So God saw it just like in Adam, all the race, in Christ, all the born again. In Moses, all Israel, in Pharaoh, all of Egypt, that is Satan and the world. So it was not God who killed them. It, because they responded by faith, Egypt did not respond by faith. And sorry, once again, he's talking about at the end of the age, when all is over, instead of the sea swallowing people, this time it will be your spirit and your soul that will be swallowed up because you did not believe the provision that he had all this while from Genesis to Revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. So I submit to you, there is no anger in God. There is no wrath in God. All that we read, there is nothing like put, I, put Isaac on your altar. There is no money. All was Christ in a type and in a shadow. In Jesus' name. Amen. So that lets me know that salvation is a big topic. Salvation is the biggest topic and the most important topic. Until you understand it, you waste your time in Christ. But we are learning and we are still learning and we are still growing. That means God's desire is for you to know this salvation inside out. You know it like you know mathematics. You know it like you know chemistry. It's sad that about 90% of believers don't know about salvation. And even though you're here teaching, you're so far back. And I used to do that. You know, I'll hear it, but I'll so far back to my old religious ways. You know, it takes time. That is why you have to be resilient. You see, you have to be resilient. You know, after all this, one small thing will come, then you forget. So in God's mercy, he used the Holy Spirit to keep on reminding you, reminding you, reminding you, reminding you, until then your spiritual muscles, some will say muscles, <laughs> will become matrified. Now you know that they, they can't deceive you anymore. Amen. Let me give way for some questions. Hello, Pastor. Yes, Sister Sherry. <laughs> I've got one question, then I've got um, something to add. Um, yes. I've been reading the book of Acts. Yes. Yeah? And I realized that from the sermon and preaching of Peter and also Stephen, it referred to, they referred to Jesus as a prophet. That have you not heard or have you not been told that our forefather Abraham or that Moses said there is a common prophet, things like that. So is this an interpretation problem? Because I'm coming from the other side of the religion, from the Muslim side, I used to be, they believe Jesus as a prophet. So now, if in so many places, I'm using the NIV version, um, the, 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 the disciples who have been with Christ were still referring, even though they were quoting the Old Testament, they were referring to Jesus as prophet. So I just wanted clarification with that. Is that an interpretation problem or what? Then number um, the second yes. thing I just wanted to add is quickly, mm -hmm. um, like to add to all that you have said. I will read till verse seven of the Act of Apostle. I can see how, just like you said in the past, that the gospel of Jesus has already been like, preached in the Old Testament because the disciples were referring back to the Old Testament, the prophecies and all that's happened in the Old Testament, relating it now to the coming of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. So that's one, that's not a question, I'm just adding to it. Then I read um, Act of Apostles 7 and I can see why Stephen was stoned to death. Wow, such an audacity, such boldness. The guy preached the old gospel from Genesis to, um, is it to Malachi or what? 
within how many hours to these people and they <laughs> could not bear it. They could not, because I was, I was reading, it's about how many pages? And I know this even summary, they compressed it. It's about two or three pages, three pages or more than two pages. It started from how God created from Abraham to Moses to all of them and how it came down to Jesus and how they have refused to believe. And he said there in um, what, one thing that fasc fascinated me, in, if we look at um, chapter seven verse from verse 51, he asked them, he said, has there been any prophet that has come that you people have not persecuted? Mm. It's mm. always adding your heart. Mm. He talked about how even before Moses was called, um, when he was in Egypt, when he killed one of the Egyptians, and he was trying to now um, resolve the conflict between two of the Israelites. And they turned against him and said, oh, you want to kill us just like you killed the Egyptian. And he ran away. But this was a man doing just cause for them. And then when he came back again to, 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 to save them um, with the help of the God and obviously with the spirit of God then as well. They turned like, on him they, in, in, the, in, the, in the Mount of um, is it An Anon or something, where they created the image and all that. So Stephen kind of broke, you know, it just went through everything in like a chronological order. And That's right. Gave them the full gospel and they couldn't stand it. And me reading it, I'm like, wow. And the truth and they had to kill the man so that's just what i wanted to say but my question is the issue of the prophet you blow me away <laughs> sister sherry uh sorry who is talking nina yes nina yes yes okay come in quickly before i didn't obey from what she said because i i think uh, with you pastor you know i've read the whole um acts to um not revelate apart from revelation yeah. But then I'll start it again to reread it. Yeah, like, great. Advising us. So today as well, I did read about uh, Stefan and how he, like, you know, he went from Genesis and, like, you know, um, spoke about all that. I thought the same as well. What kind of bone? And they were just there listening. Yeah. But at the end, you know, people's heart, they still stone him to death. So I just want to share that. That's what I read today in the morning as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have the spirit of God and be bold enough, like them apostles, to speak of the word of God and with no fear and with wow. no kind of reluctant and stuff like that. So, yeah, that is kind of empowering and telling us to just stay focused and to stay in the truth, regardless of whatever anyone will say to us and whatever, how people will receive the gospel. The true um, word of God, we should stay on point and speak Glory. as apostles did, because that's the word of God and it's never changed. So I just Amen. Want to that. Glory. Amen. Let me before I answer that question about the prophet. Let me. I want to know. I want you to note something. Look at when Sister Sherry and Sister Nina were talking. Did you notice how because they were speaking from a document that is post resurrection? Did you notice the anointing that there was there was there was like the anointing kicked in? You know, that's what I said. The epistles are the revelation of the Old Testament. As she was speaking, could you see? It, she was like a preacher woman. <laughs> you know, you see that the epistles are the revelation. Look at the look at the clarity that she's got. The clarity that and Sister Nina, you see, that is why I keep on hammering the epistles. Oh, sorry. The, sorry, epistles sorry. the epistles. The epistles. They, 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 there's this um description that they gave that his face looked like an angel yeah. to the people he was looking yeah. at him. So that's that, just shows how anointing and power yes, yes. He, he had in him. So yes, yes. Excellent. <laughs> so in coming to the prophet, remember the reason why um, um, he used the word prophet was the fact that it was because of his audience. Okay, it was because of his audience. Remember that in Luke 24, Jesus himself said something similar. You know, he said something similar about using the word prophet so that, that you will not believe that which from the beginning of Moses, the prophet and the Psalms concerning me. So the reason why he used prophets there was not trying to belittle Jesus, but he wanted to relate to them and know that the language that they could understand then, because as for Israel, eh, they are big on prophets. They are big on prophets. They are, they've got some what we call big boys. They don't joke with. One of them is Abraham. Another one is Moses. Then they have got also Isaiah. These are their big boys, so don't joke with them. Then they have also got their Jeremiah. Then they've got Elijah and Elisha. You know, if you go to Israel now, 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 now. And if you like, now, please don't, please don't do it. I'm telling you, if you travel to Jerusalem, don't do this mistake. 
Don't go and stand in any way and say that Moses is silly. Hey, hey. The whole city will turn on you. So he was trying to use their language, you know, because you could see that if you, in that same Acts chapter 7, he said, he blasted them and said, you guys are stiff-necked. You are stiff-necked. So he just used prophet for, for it to resonate with the fact that the message that all the other prophets have spoken from Moses is still the same. Jesus is not different in terms of, we use the word prophet in terms of message because the word prophet is a Greek word, prophetizo. And the word prophetizo means a, a person who tells a message, who delivers a message. So the word prophet, prophetizo, just simply means message bearer. So he used prophet not because of the office of the prophet. He used prophet to designate the fact that the message in the mouth of Moses, the message in the mouth of Jesus, like I thought today, is the same. Just that under that time, it was used, it was, he used stories, typologies, and nightmares. But now Jesus is the fulfillment of that message. That's what he was just trying to say. Amen. So that is how you have to differentiate it. He was using the word prophet just to mean that the content of their sayings, their message, what it was pointing to is consistent, is the same. Jesus didn't come with something different, and most of them didn't say something different. In fact, Jesus even said somewhere in the gospel, he said that, for Moses wrote concerning me. Moses, but they didn't know that. He said, Moses wrote concerning me. It was me who was writing about, but you guys were seeing it only as laws, okay? But hey, you know what? Sister Seria and Stalina. There's one verse here at the end, uh, 51. I think it's at 7, 51. I have flow. Include, um, uh, concluded about taste. That's the word I was referring to, yeah. Of the prophet, did your fathers not prosecute and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one? Yeah. Prophet, prophet, but then that's the one that he, the, the message was for the just one. So who's the just one? Is Christ. That's right. But I think he was just referring to the prophet as the Old Testament. Quoting that's right. Sister Sherry, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. um, said, but at the end he said the just one. So you've killed everyone who was telling about the one that we was to come, which is the just, which is Christ. That's Jesus. right. That's right. So the so just once again, to make sure that the message is consistent, because Sister Sherry, the problem that we are having with um, so-called um, other religions, because I don't call Christianity a religion anyway, it's debatable, mm. but it's the fact that they think that the, the reason that they think that the, the message is different. So that's why, for example, when you sit down, for example, I sat down with my neighbor who is a Muslim, and she is saying that this is what they believe. You know, and then you are saying that when they say they believe in Isa, you know. So I asked her a question. I said that, so what is your message? She couldn't answer. She sat down. I said, what exactly are you projecting? She couldn't answer. I said, well, let me tell you something. Well, the message is this. It's called, it has been consistent. She said, wow, I didn't know that. So that is why, that is why at the end there, he said that it had to refer to him, Jesus, showing that the message is the same. All religions try to make their thing look like, you know, oh, um, um, uh, uh, the message is different. So the question I ask is that if it is God, why are the messages different? <laughs> see that? You see, if we say we are all worshiping the same God, <laughs> why then is somebody's message content different? One says kill, one says walk in love. One says you have to use any performance. One says believe in him. Another one says that, oh, the law of karma. Oh, this. So it shows that something is not right. So by using that statement, he wanted to show that, listen, the message is consistent. Moses is not different from what Jesus has said. The apostles, what they are saying is not different from what we read from the Old Testament saying. All of them, they were killed because they were pointing to something which you people didn't want to accept. And that thing has been fulfilled in Christ. Mm. Yes, uh, even in the Quran, Pastor, I've heard that yes. they speak more of Jesus than himself, the prophet Muhammad. Yeah. Yeah, but the only thing that they don't believe, they, the only thing that, well, Sister Shelly will bear me out witness here because she she has been in, I mean, she was in that field. What they don't believe is that Jesus is God. They don't accept that. Mm. Yeah, that they don't accept it. They, they, they see him as Isa. They, they call him one of the prophets. They, they, they say that, and they use the word son of God because they think that Jesus is like in Nigerian language, Jesus is God picking. Right? And then they quote, they come back and quote back Isaiah and and said, so Isaiah said that I do not begat nor have I begotten anybody. We do, they don't understand what that Bible verse is saying. So their struggle is that they don't know that Jesus is God. That is where the problem is. And that is why if you go to 
Lady Patience read something on Sunday. He said that the Antichrist is the one who says that God does not come in the flesh. In First John, see that. He said, anyone that says that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh is the Antichrist. Because it is not everybody who believes that. They can't, they, can't even make, they can't even make head of it. How? How? God, Jesus is God. No, no. <laughs> you know? So that, that, is, that is where, yes, they mention his name, but they don't believe that he is God. And that is where we, we are different, that Jesus is God. Is God who became a man. And they, that one, it boggles their mind. They cannot accept it. Amen. But you know, good show, guys. You know what? You made my day. Shall I, can I do break dancing here, please? <laughs> you know, Sister Sherry, Sister Nina, but good show. And I'm sure others are doing the same thing about good show. I'm telling you, the epistles, I like the way Sister Sherry was saying that. She said when she was reading it, you could feel, you know, it's, it's, look at the way she went, oh my God. I mean, you could literally feel the anointing. You could literally feel the anointing. You know, the epistles are just, mwah, and especially the acts of the apostles. Oh my goodness me. Look at these guys, man. It is fantabulous. So keep up the good work. And, you, and, and by that, you guys are going. Any other thing before and, we close? And just quickly as well. Why, yes. Um, I just felt like um, when these two couples, uh, Manane and Safira, when they fell down and died um, in the in the book of Acts, <laughs> that's, that's what that I was, was about to start up as well. Was. I need, we need the proper going on that because reading yeah. it without the explanation, it will seem like the apostles. Okay. Actually okay. Them. okay. Oh, <laughs> you, oh, you, oh, you nearly gave it away. You nearly gave it away. Okay. Okay. Quickly. This is hey, Friday's hour. Those who are at work, fine. Hey, but let me learn yeah. something. So, okay. What I just wanted to say is. Yeah. Um, I just find it too prompt. I, I guess it is a sin, but it wasn't for me. Well, maybe I'm just judging, but I mean, I, I, it's something they could repent of if they've been told to repent. But the instant judgment, like they just fell down and died, I'm like, what was that all about? First is their land. They decided they would sell it, which was what Paul said to them. You can decide not to, but you chose to. You can decide to keep the money, but you chose to give it. Or why are you lying? And I'm like, okay, but you, they could be told off and they could repent for me. And why were they struck down dead? So I just want a bit of clarification. That. Question I was waiting for. Woo! All right, let's do some quick exegesis on that rapidly. And then we shall close that. It's getting exciting. I love it. All right, let us read carefully. Watch, watch, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they have used that to lambast believers so much, but observe. Now a man named Ananias, straight away there's something wrong there. Straight away there's something wrong there. In all the writings of the apostles, when they are referring to born again folk, they would clearly state now a brother, now a sister, or brethren, or they will say those that believed, or those that had received the word. So that means straight away, he said, now a man. Another translation says, now a certain man. That means Ananias and Sapphira were not born again. So let us see what happened. These guys had heard about that. Remember, by this time, the church had increased to 5,000. 3,000 souls, 2,000 souls on the day of, of Pentecost, and then 3,000 extra were added, making 5,000. And, 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 the, and the gospel was now spreading. So at that time, you know, the, the community, let, 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 me just, let me just go back. Let's, let me go back. 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 Let's do Acts 4. Now, sometimes you are tempted to think Acts chapter 4 to Acts chapter 5 is Monday and Tuesday, but there might be a few years. Now, let's go all the way down here. Let me see it. Let me start from here. The, the argument started from here. Now watch, look at the language carefully. Now the company of believers, so there was a company of believers, those who were born again, was of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was exclusively his own, but everything was common property for the use of all. 33. And with great ability and power, the apostles were continuously testifying to the resurrection of the Lord. And great grace, God's remarkable loving kindness and favor and goodwill rested richly upon them. 34. There was not a needy person among them because those who were owners of land, these are all believers or houses, were selling them and bringing their proceeds to of the sales and placing their money down and the apostles' feet. Please! Apostles' feet does not mean that in church I am standing there and I say, come and put money on my feet. It's a figure of speech. 
It just it means that they brought it to the accountability of the apostles. It doesn't mean physical feet. It's it's sorry, verbiage. Sorry, Pastor. Thank yes. you for that. Because in NIV, it didn't say apostle faith. It said, and they bring the money to the apostle to, um, to give to those in need. That's Thank you. NIV version. Thank you. Thank you. You see, that's why. Thank you, Reverend. That's why we should study. Let's go on. Then it was distributed to each one, anyone has need. Now, Joseph, a Levite and a native of Cyprus, who was sent in Barnabas by the apostles, so this one is a believer, which translated means son of encouragement, sold a field belonging to him and brought the money and set it at the apostles' feet. The same terminology. No problem. So now, so far, all these things here that we have read, they are all believers. So now let us get into the Ananias and Sapphira problem. Now, Watch. Don't think that Acts chapter 4, and then when we get to Acts chapter 5, it's Monday and Tuesday. That is why it started with now. That means that the, a, time, a time transpired. It could be one week, it could be two. That means that this was going on. The disciples were going, were preaching the word, and when people had money, they would bring it and help those who didn't have. So that means that people were observing. So Ananias and Sapphira did something. They were saying, you know what? If these people are true believers, let us go and trick them and see whether they will notice whether we are believers or not. See, let us see whether we'll see the answer. Now, a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge and complicity. Look at that word. Complicity. Complicity means that they sat down and they planned to try and come and see whether if the apostles will notice whether this thing that they have come to join them, whether they were unbelievers or not. He kept back some of the proceeds, bringing only a portion of it and set it at the apostles' feet as if they were believers. Question, that means they had heard that this practice was going on. Just like some people, I remember years ago in within the body of Christ, some brothers come into church and act like they are born again just to marry some sisters. Then they tell themselves, if she's born again, she'll notice that I am fake. And they come and join and do that. Oh, single, single, praise the Lord. They do everything. And some sisters don't know. Then goes on. Look at this. Look at it. Look at look at where the problem is. But Peter said, who said? Wait, Peter didn't know Ananias and Sapphira. This guy just came. That means it was a, 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 a day like Monday or Tuesday. They just came among them. So this is where the whole thing changed. Watch. But Peter said, Ananias, why has who? Who? Satan, fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. How did Peter know? Peter operated in a gift called the gift of the word of knowledge. There was no way Peter would have known that, except the Holy Spirit revealed that to him. That is what shocked Ananias. Go on. He said, cut back yourself some proceeds from the sale of the land. Verse 4, as long as it remained unsold, did not remain your own to do with what you please. And after it was sold, was the money not under your control? So Peter, by revelation, saw the whole process. Why is it that you can have conceived this act of hypocrisy and deceit? So they planned it in your heart. You have not simply lied to people, but to God. Now, that to God there means that they, these believers were a community who presented God. Look at this, verse 5. And hearing these words... Ananias fell down suddenly and died. Ladies and gentlemen, let us observe with, with alacrity and intelligence. It never said that it was God who killed him. There is nothing there that suggests that. It was shock. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, wait. Somebody might say, oh, Pastor Fred, wait. I'm coming. Wait, wait, wait. Let me show you. Let me show you something. Imagine that you are traveling to Nigeria or Ghana, okay? And you have hidden something in your bag. To you, or no, no, let, 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 me, let me bring a better example. Let me bring a better example. There were some times that some people, you know, used to use some people's document to travel. I've heard that so many times. You know, they use some people's document. They change the picture, I don't know where, you know. And, and, and you were cool when you left Mutala Mohammed. You were cool when you left Congo. You were cool when you left Accra. It looked like nothing happened. And to you, it is fine. But once you were sitting on the plane, you know, you were breaking out in cold sweat when you landed in Heathrow. Because now you don't really know. But, you know, you talk, oh, okay, no, no, no. Then all of a sudden, when you get to the, you get to migration, look at it. <laughs> when they look at your passport, they say, 
excuse me, ma'am, follow me. Question, even though it might not be like this, but question, what will happen to you? Oh, some, if you are not, some people will develop diarrhea. Some will develop diarrhea, I'm telling you. Some will start breaking out in cold sweat. Everybody is different. Well, some people will keep up, some people will be cool. Some people, they, for them, nothing faces them. But that was the situation. It was a heart attack. He never believed that, because they came to see whether they'll be able to detect whether these guys are truly, they say they are working by the spirit of God. This is what they say they are believers. They say they are believers. Um, let's do, let's see, don't see anything, bring it. That is what happened. And he, look at it, verse five. And hearing these words, Ananias, fell down suddenly and died. That is a case of heart attack now. It's crazy. The friends call it Chris cardiac. And great fear and all grief those But let's look at the next one. The next one is what Sister Nina mentioned. And the young men in the congregation got up and wrapped up their body and carried it out and buried it. Verse seven. Now after an interval of about what? Three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, whether you sold your land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said, how could you two have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to test? So Paul, ex Peter exposed their plot. They came to test to see whether these people that they are saying they are believers. They say they are believers. There is no way they will know that we have, we have connived and come and we are not even believers to come and swerve them and, and see, let's see. So that is also another word of knowledge. But look at Peter. This is where, this is where I want you to observe. Look. The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Who said it? Peter. Now, at this time, let me explain a little bit background to this. Don't forget, these guys had just gotten born again. Paul had not yet joined the bandwagon yet. Here, we are talking about probably about AD, probably about AD 2030. So they still had a lot of Jewish Old Testament mindset. They still had Old Testament mindset. So here, it was the pronouncement of Peter that brought death to this woman. It was not God. Now somebody say, but it's the spirit of God in them. Yes, the power is given to you. Mm -hmm. But when you speak, there are atmospheric spirits as well. You've got demons and we've got angels. Even though, even though you have got the spirit of God in you, but your words can attract wrong spirits. And can execute. That's why I hear some pastors say, Hey, as for me, if you don't know, if I catch it to happen, it's not God endorsing that prayer. It is demons, because the Bible says what? Proverbs chapter 19 said the word, for death and life are in the power of your tongue. So it was not God. No. That's why I said Peter. <laughs> it was Peter. Because I remember you saying we've got the power, we choose how to use the power. Exactly. God has not given it us to use it in the wrong way. It was exactly. Peter. It was Peter. <laughs> Peter did. That is why later, if you study through all again, Peter never made that mistake anymore. Again. No. That is why, you, to prove it to you, Acts chapter 9, for God to get Peter out of that wrong mindset, Peter was on the rooftop in Simon the Tanner's house. And then he saw a big sheet coming down with four corners, with all manner of clean on clean. And then a voice said, Peter, rise, kill. <laughs> kill it. Peter said, not so long. No, 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 no. He came again, Peter, rise, kill. Because I know you, you, you are sharp, sharp. You are sharp, sharp. Who was the one, who was the one that took the sword? Peter. Uh -huh. <laughs> So he remembered what Jesus Christ told him. You know, so God realized that, hey, Peter, as for Peter, has if I don't, if I, he, has not, he has not repented. If I don't say, so he after, too quickly. <laughs> he's too quick. So when Peter, when God wanted me to so if I don't sort Peter out, when Cornelius men come, Peter will fight with them because they were Gentiles. And they were not supposed to meet. So remember what happened. Immediately he saw that vision. The Bible says the spirit told him, three men are waiting for you outside. Hmm. Do not ask any question. So Peter went down. Then when Peter went down, he said, uh -huh. so what? He said, well, we are sent by Cornelius. Then he said, for I know that God has no, is no respect of person. See, that incident was what convinced Peter that God, God, God has nothing against him. And that's not the correct attitude. 
So he said, okay, then I'll go with you to, to Ananias. But Pastor, that story, do you know a lot of church use that according to um to frighten people with not giving offering, they um tithes, God will kill you, you're stealing from God. This <laughs> so, Stalina, you are you are you are you are you one hundred percent. That is why I stress there. So true. It is that apostles, I like the way Sister Sherry was smart. That is that's why sometimes you have to look at it in other translations. The apostles' feet is not meaning physical feet that they've been using. Hey! Then they even do days called apostles' feet service. Mm -hmm. It is just a figure of speech, which means that mm -hmm. under, under, under the what? Under the uh, jurisdiction or accountability of the apostles. For them, for them to bring it to the apostles' feet means that the apostles in Jerusalem and, or in Antioch, they were the ones in charge of the body of Christ then. That is all it just means. So they have used this. That's why it's a single mention. They have used this. They have used this to try and put pressure and fear in believers. But that is what it is. So the first one, in the case of the husband, that was a heart attack. The second one, it was Peter. It was Peter. So God is not involved. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, hello, Pastor. Can you hear me? Flo, Flo. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that um, explanation and the um, interpretation. Um, in Book of Acts, chapter one, I just wanted to clarify something as well. Yes. It says during the forty days after he suffered and died, talking about Jesus, he yes. appeared to the apostle from time to time before he was taken up um, into the sky. Yes. Has this forty days got anything to do with the kind of forty days? Um, I'll say maybe it's ritual, or whatever we do now, whereby when people die, they'll say, oh, we're doing 40 days prayer or memorial, or whatever, after 40 days, you know? No, not at all, not at all. No, it has nothing to do with that. The, the, in fact, uh, let me give you a quick background also. Um, the book of Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. You can notice that by Acts chapter one. In Acts chapter one, it says that, that let, let me just show that to you. So that you see that it's, it's, a, it's a continuum. So that means that the end, the end of, 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 of Luke, which is Luke 24, where Jesus was teaching them, watch, look at this. Look at Acts chapter one. The first account I made, the writer, the writer is Luke. Theophilus was a continuous report. See, because Luke was the one that wrote the book of Luke. So Acts is a continuous report. He's continuing from where he dropped off in Luke 24 about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. So what did he begin to do and teach? Luke 24, where he told them how the Old Testament should be explained and how the New Testament should be explained. And to the day when he ascended to heaven and after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given instructions to the apostles, special messengers whom he had chosen, to these men, he also showed himself alive. So this is what we call historical account. After his suffering in Gethsemane on the cross, by a series of many infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and talking to them about the things concerning the kingdom. So the purpose of that 40 days was to explain, was, was actually the continuation of Luke 24. He was explaining to them the purpose of the Old Testament, the purpose of the New Testament, and the emphasis of the teaching. He was laying the foundation of how the Bible must be explained. That is all he was doing those 40 days. It took 40 days to explain that. Oh, so it, okay. it has nothing to do with, you no, know, when people die, 40 days, da, 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 da. no, nothing to do with that, like that. Just purely, just purely a completely theological, that's all. Oh, okay, thank you so much, sir. Awesome, you. awesome, awesome, awesome. Whoa, I've lo I love this. This is this, this called pro this proper teaching. Bible school, that's it. You don't even get this. <laughs> when I say this, people are like, you don't even get this Bible school. <laughs> But we when you start asking too many questions, the lecture should, will, will just throw you off. <laughs> oh, that was good. All right. But you know what? I'm proud of you guys. Hey, you guys, I'm telling you, continuing the epistles. That's a good material. Reading the book of Acts of the Apostles. When you're reading it, something I use Bible Gateway, but if you've got something, but you can, you know, Bible Gateway, you see on the right here, here, on this, you have four icons here. This shows to share. This is to print. This is to settings or page option. Then there's this here. Add parallel. So which means that you can bring other Bible translations as a parallel on the side, which is a very good feature. Because sometimes, like you see what I read in Apostles' Feet, but in the NIV, he said they just brought it to the apostles. There was no feet. You know, just like the same mistake people do with Holy Ghost fire. When you go into <laughs> when you go into Matthew, Jesus 
Christ, it was John who used, he shall baptize thee with the Holy Ghost and fire. But if you come into the other one, Jesus Christ never used the word fire. So fire was mentioned once. The fire is not talking about the fact that it is destructive. That's not what it meant. He just trying to say that the way that fire consumes stuff, so also when you're born again, it consumes the old life in Adam. That's what he was saying. It's not about fire like destruction. So when believers have used it, you know, when you know when they want to do something bad to somebody, hey, you have taken my money, you have taken my money, holy ghost, fire consuming. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what it means, man. So reading it in different Bible translations is very, very helpful because one translator might have missed it, another translator might have. My favorite, my favorite is um the amplified. The New Living Translation, the Passion Translation, and the NIV. Okay. The King James has got the worst of mistakes. When we say mistakes, in terms of translation and grammatical errors in it. So, but for me, my number one is amplified, followed by the Passion Translation, then the New Living Translation, and then maybe even either the Message or the NIV. You know, so you, you can get. So when you are reading some a very difficult. When Sorry, mine is L NLT, not NIV. Oh, oh, that's a good one. New Living Translation yeah, is, is excellent. That's very good. That's very, that's the one that is recommended even in most Bible schools when they are doing their Bible study as um, the, the Bible they must purchase. So when you are dealing with uh, difficult topics like, um, oh, what do we mean? Difficult books like the book of Romans, that is a bit technical. If you think you are reading that and you are not making sense of it, switch to the NLT, the New Living Translation, or switch to the Passion Translation to clarify all the technical terms up for it. And that's what I do. When I'm reading something, it's, it's, it's becoming a bit too difficult and too technical for me. I just switch from the Amplified and I go to the NLT or I go to the uh, Passion Translation and I, it, it clears it up for me in a very nice way. Amen. So keep the good work you guys are doing. Keep it up. Because this year, by the grace of God, which I'm here to announce, we are going to start cell meetings. So all of you are involved. <laughs> You're going to be cell leaders. <laughs> so take your work study serious. So when it comes, we shall all do a good job. And you started already. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are exhausted now. Thank you very much, Sister Nina. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Thank you, Sister Sherry. Thank you, Sister Hetty. Thank you, Sister Rosemary. Thank you, Sister Sheila. And I think there was somebody else that was there. Sister Angela was there as well earlier on and somebody else was there and my own and only one and only lady p you know you guys are amazing i enjoyed spending my time with you guys you guys are going by leaps and bounds let's keep the good work you know awesome 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 and we have our prayer meeting tonight love you guys amazing amazing stuff amazing bye for now uh, thank Bless. you bye everyone bye, see you later bye. Bye. see you later right bye 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 bye